to keep us Americans focusing on the colors that divide us and not the colors that unite us. Welcome to the Fall Estate. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. The Fall Estate now is now on Locals.com. So click the link in the description there to support our work. And thank you all in advance. I do appreciate it. Also, remember you can support the Fall Estate by joining the channel membership. Our channel membership on YouTube. So you can support the Fall Estate by joining our channel membership on YouTube. Very interesting guest today. I have with me Pastor Mark Burns. He is the CEO of the Now Television Network, founder of the Harvest Praise and Worship Center of Easley, and was labor by Time Magazine as Trump top pastor. Amazing. Pastor Byrne, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. What an honor to be here, sir. What a great honor yeah. uh, that you've been doing. So it's hop I'm very humbled to be here. Thank you. I appreciate that. And so the Time Magazine called you the top Trump pastor. And was that, is that true? You were the top pastor? Well, <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, I don't consider myself the top pastor, but I'm honored that Time Magazine gave me that label. Yeah. Um, Partially, partially because I was one of the first uh, pastors to support uh, Donald Trump's run for president way back in 2015. And I was a vocal supporter then um, and been fighting ever since. Um, I spoke at the Republican National Convention. And uh, you know, again, I'll be with him tomorrow as we do this again for the third time for his first presidential uh, ca official campaign event. Um, in South Carolina. And so That's uh, amazing. That, that title just came from them because they saw me out front uh, in the media. Uh, and then the president himself gave me that honor title by calling me his his pastor. So nice. I'm, I'm humble. And so how are you able to say how that came about? Are you able to say how you came? How did it come that you became one of the pastors on his uh, committee there? What well, was a divine Campaign. appointment, uh, Brother Jesse? Uh, I've been very clear uh, to every media outlet uh, that for me, this is not a political calculation. Um, I don't care what events or what stages I am on or what uh, uh, political entities and I'm, I, I have influence with. For me, it's not a political calculation, Brother Jesse. It's a divine appointment um, by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that he would set up his men and women of God to be to have an ear to the kings of the land. Um, and so for me, it started with my television network. Uh, I own, as you declared, the uh, second largest black owned and operated Christian TV network in America called the Now Television Network based in South Carolina. We have the privilege and honor to broadcast our 24 seven channel signal to 236 million homes in 83 countries on cable here in America and satellite uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Europe, and the United States. So because of that, um, I was invited to a meeting back in 2015 um, to listen to a man who I didn't know uh, by the name of Donald Trump. I had no, I didn't really know him. I knew he had a show. And I knew he was a man that was known for wealth, but I had I never watched his show, never followed him, yeah. was not a fan. Um, matter of fact, Brother Jesse, when I got there, uh, I was blown away by the other men and women of God who I would consider my heroes uh, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, people like um, um, Brother uh, Kenneth Copeland and others who were there. And I was more excited to see those men of God <laughs> than to meet Donald Trump. But long story short, uh, I asked a question, Brother Jesse, that changed my life in this meeting. I knew I was one of the small dogs. I wasn't one of the big guys. Um, I was, I flew, at that time, I flew 
Um, I didn't fly private like most of those guys. I flew uh, a commercial <laughs> way in the back of the seat, right? <laughs> the back of the at the back of the plane, right? right. Um, and so I was just happy, brother Jesse, to be in the room. And I'm gonna try to cons- consolidate this answer, but I was just happy to be in the room. But the Holy Spirit uh, told me as I was there. Uh, I was not feeling worthy to be in the room of these great generals in the body of Christ and to be in the presence of this man named Donald Trump, this billionaire. I was just uh, humbled to be there. And I began to hear the Holy Spirit say, Mark, I placed you there. Mark, I put you there. You belong there. And as he began to say that through the Spirit, I became confident, Brother Jesse, and this boldness that came over me, the kind of boldness that I'm still aspiring to have like you got, because you got a boldness that I don't have. That's another level a boldness that I'm trying to get to. But there was a boldness that came over me. And I said, Mr. Trump, and remember, nobody knew who I was. I wasn't famous. I was just this yeah. unknown guy. And I said, Mr. Trump, there were several black leaders that were scheduled to come to this meeting, but many of them backed out because of this reputation that you are seemingly having as just racist. Um, and I said, if you be, do become president, what is your vision? What is your goal to bridge the gap between the black community, um, the Republican Party, and uh, um, and and yourself? How are we going to make this work for all Americans, specifically to the black community? And he he was excited that I asked that question. And it was at that point, brother Jesse, that that one question dominated the meeting for the next two and a half hours. And it was after that meeting that the president or Donald Trump at the time back in 2015 asked if I would be willing to bring a group of black leaders, uh, black pastors to Trump Towers. And that kind of how the rest is history. Myself, along with pastors like Pastor Darren Scott, who was leading the way, um, helped brought a a, a massive number of of black pastors to Trump Towers. And the rest is really history. At that point, I've been um, preaching the gospel of Jesus but also talking about the policies that are failing, number one, our people, but also that is hurting uh, religious liberties across this nation. Yeah, amazing. Um, I noticed, uh, and then I want to move on here, but I noticed that a lot of people who have been close to the great white hope, Donald Trump, (laughs) I call him the great white hope. (laughs) I noticed that a lot of people have been attacked by the, the Democrats and the Department of Justice and all that. Are you concerned or uh, have you been concerned that they may try to attack you and try to hurt you in, in one way or another? Well, you know, I, I spoke uh, uh, in January 6th. I was there. I was one of the speakers. Oh, okay. Uh, January 5th and then there on January 6th. And I was escorted out of the premises when all of the riot took place. Uh, of course, my name was on the list of, of, of those to investigate for that initial January 6th list, the top 50 or 55 people that was that was in the initial release uh, list. And so um, to be honest with you, brother, uh, I don't have any holes in my hands. <laughs> I don't have any holes in my feet. <laughs> I don't have, brother Jesse, any holes in my side that a spear, you understand, was stuck in my side to see if I was still breathing. I, Brother Jesse, wasn't suffocated on a cross, right? With mocked with a crown of thorns on my head. So to think about any kind of persecution that might come from the United States government or any retaliation is nothing compared to what Master Jesus has done for us uh, on the body of Christ. And so uh, I fear no man, um, just like you. you, I fear no man. I, I serve one master and his name is Jesus, our Messiah. And so for me, I don't fear that. Did I suffer? 100%. Did uh, I lose a lot? Absolutely. You know, my business lost over 40, 45% in a matter of two weeks. In a matter of two weeks, Black people who were on my network were counseling their contract left and right, left and right. I had so much hate uh, you know, from my own people. I never experienced this kind of a hate before. Um, you know, I, I was called more racially names in my entire life, not by white people, but by my own people, people that look like me. And so, yes, my name, my reputation within my community uh, has been damaged. But again, to God, I live. To God, I die. Though he's slave me, yet I still would trust him. So God gave me an assignment, like he gave you an assignment, to be a voice in the wilderness to declare the truth, no matter where it leads me. So I'm willing to lose favor with man 
to gain favor with God. And that's been my center thought process. When the attack was going on, you're losing your, uh, your uh, clients there for your network. When they were falling away from you, how did you feel about that? What were you thinking at the time that it was happening? That this was it. This is over. <laughs> I worked so hard to build this up, and this is this is what's going to happen. And I I had to just get to the point to believe that if I lost my TV studio, if I lost my building, that Lord, I'll go back to my home, go back to my living room where my TV network started, and I just got to trust God that you, if you gave it to me the first time, you would give it to me the second time. It was a faith thing. I lost weight. It was a heavy weight. I'm not trying to sit here and pretend to you, Brother Jesse, that I was Superman. No, I was Clark Kent, right? I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have on the cape that day, right? Yeah. And so uh, I, I um, uh, it, it, it was a challenge. And, and I had to really, brother, and I say really, I mean, I had to really dig deep um, into my faith and where people couldn't, couldn't make you feel good about opening up the media and only negative things are about you. Now, brother, I know you one of the very few people uh, in America that understands exactly what I'm feeling, what I what I'm talking about to where the mainstream media don't seem to love you. The mainstream media don't seem to care about you. They will find a way to vilify you even now, even now, right now. I'm, I'm apparently a leader now of a new cult. <laughs> right. And so I got to, it's always something new that so, they keep coming out with. I am a televangelist that steals money from people. When, if you knew me, you would discover I am literally my ministry's biggest donor, right? I yeah. mean, I am the biggest giver of my ministry. Uh, always have been. i um, never take, don't even take a salary, never have taken a salary from my church. But yet that's the mindset that the mainstream media uh, and then, and the sad part about it is that other preachers within the church believes it. Yeah. Other people, yeah. pastors yeah. who are supposed to be, you know, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, who's supposed to be the, you know, the body surrounding itself, coming together, supporting each other. That doesn't happen. They leave you out there to the wolves all by yourself, as well, you though you are truly guilty for taking money from poor people, not realizing that we buy cars for people. We put people in homes. We pay down payments on, on housing. We get people in apartment complexes. We help people build their credit scores so that they can go and get their own homes. We help people with daycare bills, right? This has, but yet the media will tell you, and if you read anything about me, HBO, all of them, they will tell you, I am this money grubbing televangelist <laughs> yeah. that's out there asking people for money, making sure that I can fly private while poor people live in poor government housing. And that is so far from the truth. The people that were close to you prior to all that happening, and you thought that they knew you, they, you thought that if anything ever happened, that they would be the ones that would know you. They would be close to you. They, would, they couldn't be influenced. Were you surprised when they turned on you? When, because you thought they knew Pastor Byrne more than the media or some of your closest family members. Were you, su you surprised? How, yeah, how, were you surprised that the ones that were the closest to you were the ones that turned on you? Brother JC, absolutely. I, I felt a little bit like Jesus. I can I can understand how <laughs> Jesus felt yeah. when all the naysayers, yeah. all of the people that 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 you know, once we're saying Hosanna, 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 but that very same group of people were crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. That didn't really hurt Jesus as much as when, number one, Peter yeah. denied Jesus three times. The Bible says Jesus took to Peter and said, Peter, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, oh, Lord, I would never, never, never do that. Never. But then we know the story three times. On the third time, Peter cussed and said, I absolutely don't know Jesus. Judas, we all know Judas, who kissed Jesus. The betrayal yeah. of the people that saw you raise the dead, people that watched the Holy Spirit work through Jesus. Well, I kind of feel that way with people, especially locally here at home. I can care less now right. uh, of the mass media, what they say about me. I care less of what people say uh, on their Twitter feeds or their Facebook feeds or, you know, uh, how much of a bald-faced liar I am and all these things. I take money from the poor and 
enrich myself, all these lies that care. It is the people that know me. Yeah. It's the people that yeah. grew up with me. It's the people that can actually pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, brother, hey, cousin, hey, uh, nephew or something, yeah. uh, you know, family member. You know, I, I could pick they could pick up the phone and call you, but they don't. What they do, they will go on social media. They go on Facebook. They have your same last name. They have your same blood type. And they will go on there and they will blast you. And those hurt the most. But you have to, you have to really, uh, you know, just trust in the Lord. I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound cliche and I truly don't want to sound like I'm preaching a sermon. But my brother, when I tell you right now that the only thing that has kept me up, it has not been family. It absolutely has not been that there are some family members that are, you know, my parents have always been there. I love my mother and father, Otis and Deborah Burns, Pastor Otis and Deborah Burns, and people like my sister who have been there. But for the most part, family member will be the first to cut you loose. Yeah. They would be the first to stab you in the back. They're the first to ignore you. They're the first to, to not invite you to their house, right? <laughs> uh, these are the people that, that hurts the most and yeah. stabs the most. But I just have to trust God. I have to just deep down and remind myself that all of this stuff, like just an example, I'm honored to be on your show. You're one of the greatest leaders that we have been having for a long time. You are a, clearly at the, the, you know, one of the top journalists and spokespersons of our movement. I have been for years, way before Donald Trump. Well, you, you've been doing this. But I don't take this stuff so serious to where I start eat, filling up my own head. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, whether I'm on your show, whether I'm on Tucker Carson, whether I'm on Sean Hannity, whether I'm on CNN or MSNBC, all this stuff don't matter. Yeah. At the end of the day, when I leave this world, and you know diamond from diamond to silk just died suddenly of heart disease. Yeah. Right, uh, due to high blood pressure, according to her, uh, uh, the the the, the uh, coroner's report, the death certificate. Right, we don't know when we're going to leave this world. So at the end of the day, for me, like David said, in my house we shall serve the Lord. I just have to trust and believe. That yeah. The days that I've cried when I'm by myself in tears, by myself, boo hoo, and wondering, God, why <laughs> have I lost so much? Even yeah. my own family, why have I suffered so much? Why is people abandoning me? Where is the church? Where are my pastor friends? How come I don't get invited as much? Why do people know me more as a political pundit than they do as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I've been preaching the gospel since I was 16 years old under my father at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. Oh, Missionary even as Baptist a friend, church in why don't they know South you as Carolina, but yet very few people around the world yeah. even believe that I still preach on Sunday. They think I'm just a political pundit. Why? Because the church goes silent. They go quiet. Yeah. They lay down and let the liberal left come and destroy us with evil and don't be bold enough like you are. I mean, you you really you really don't care. I mean, you got to have the Holy Spirit close to you, my brother, uh, to say the things that you say and to do the things that you have done and done it consistently without worrying about people hurting you or deplatforming you or cutting you off, um, but you just still been consistent. So for me, I have to just trust God. So when those attacks come, I literally fall on the voice of the Holy Spirit. I jump in God's word. I read to feel myself because people will let you down. It's interesting how Judas turned on Jesus and the disciples scattered. It sounds like that's what happened to you as well. Judas turned on Jesus and the disciples scattered. Exactly. And it's amazing to see that. So one last question about that. What did you learn about yourself when all that happened and you had to go through that. What did you learn about yourself that you had not realized before? I thought, Brother Jesse, that I had great faith. <laughs> I thought I had great faith. Yeah. I thought I was strong when I had all my children. They were little and my, and my wife. And when I had all my family, I thought I was strong when, you know, I, I, my business was growing and, and everything was going good. And when, when everybody was crowding you around and I'm on all these major platforms and people are asking for my autograph. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> asking for my autograph? Who am I? Uh, and yet to see it in many cases, uh, I discovered that I only had great faith 
because there was no real great obstacles that had entered in my life. And I realized how much, how weak I really was. Yeah. I've been pastoring, been preaching faith, been teaching about Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. I've been telling the world how good God is and how to have faith and the substance of faith, uh, 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 the substance of faith, uh, uh, and how that we need to 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 the, you know to walk in faith and not by sight, right? I preached all those messages all over the country, and I realized in all of that, I really didn't have a lot of faith at all because there was a shield of protection around me. There was a hedge, that's what happened to Job, a hedge of protection was around me and it was removed to a certain extent because it could still be worse. You understand? It could still be worse. Yeah. God has blessed us with good health. Um, it could be worse. Um, I haven't lost my business. God restored it. It'd be even greater than it is. And now yeah. we're starting a second business. Um, it could still be worse. Uh, but yet have I lost a lot? Yes. So in that valley, I discovered my faith wasn't as strong as I thought it was. That's and amazing. I had to go through that. I'm still going through it where I, uh, uh, you know, I still believe right now I'm in the lowest valley that I've ever been in my life. Uh, people see me smiling. They see me speaking. And, you know, they see me uh, doing the things. But it's those private moments, those quiet moments when everybody's gone, when the lights turn off, when the cameras goes away. And you're reminded of your 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 weaknesses. You're yeah. reminded of your infirmities. You're reminded of your uh, the fact that you are here by God's grace and grace alone. That is nothing to do with you. I don't care how many push-ups you do. I don't care how many <laughs> weight you try to lose, which I'm trying to lose a lot of weight. Uh, it doesn't matter about none of those things. We are here, uh, Brother Jesse, at the mercy of God. And my faith had to be strengthened through all of that, where... My mama couldn't give me, my daddy couldn't give it to me. Yeah. No, Nobody could pat me on the back and remind me that it's going to work out. No, it had to be the word of God. And so I've discovered how to build my own faith without any outside influences other than the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that I can tell you. And I hope that maybe somebody watching, it, yeah. they, they do the same thing. So in those quiet moments when no one is around, it's just you and, and the devil messing with you, saying that, you know, uh, it's over, you're nothing, blah, blah, blah. You might want to take your own life or whatever he tells you. How do you deal with those moments in the moments that is happening? I repeat, this is what I do. This is a, and that's a very great question because I have an exercise that I use, right? And, and, and it's like any exercise, whether it be a physical one or a mental one, if you don't use it a lot, it gets you gets weakened. But I have a, 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 a the Bible says that when Satan comes against you, God raises up a standard. The Bible also says that when you resist the devil, he will flee. So yeah. for me, what I do is that is like this. Uh, if I begin to feel low, and I begin to feel, uh, you know, uh, inadequate or, uh, you know, you start looking at your mistakes. You start looking at things that you did. It's easy to blame other folks, but when you start realizing mistakes you did, the place you in the positions that you did, uh, that you are in, right? The suffering that you're going through is at the at the of your own hands, nobody else's fault but yours. I immediately in my mind start looking for things to give God praise for. It's a real exercise. I immediately begin to start thinking, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for thank you for this house. Father, thank you. I start looking for things to thank him for. Lord, thank you for this, that I can use the restroom. Small things. It ain't big things. Father, thank you that when I use the restroom that my liver is working, my bladder is working. I literally do this, Brother Jesse. I just start thanking him. I start looking for things around me. Father, thank you, Lord, that you know I may have lost this deal and I may have lost the money of that deal or things may not be looking as good financially, but Lord, I thank you that I, I literally have this house Thank you, Father, that I have, uh, that, that my father gave me a call today and he just wanted to love on his son. You understand what I'm saying? I start looking for small things that, that define, to give God praise for, and it immediately changes my, my thought process. That's the first phase of the muscle. The second phase of the muscle is I immediately begin to remind myself how bad it really can be, <laughs> how worse than it is right now for me. Yeah. I started thinking, Lord, I haven't been 
uh, raided by the FBI. Thank you, Lord, that I haven't have to spend out millions of dollars to fight legal bills. Thank you, Lord, that I haven't been falsely accused by somebody. Thank you, Lord, that my business is still growing. And that, Father, thank you that, it, that, that I, I don't have a cancer report. Thank you, Lord, that my blood vessels are working. I mean, I, I really start thinking how worse it could be. Thank you, Lord, that, that my house hasn't burnt down, that my business hasn't burnt down. And Father, I'm not back in Belton, South Carolina, laying on my parents' couch. Thank you, Lord, that I get to fly first class. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I start thinking about how worse it could be, Amazing. right? No matter how, how sad I might be for that moment, it can be worse because there are people who are around the world, who they wish they could replace you. And I yeah. realized that where I'm at right now <laughs> is literally at the grace and the mercy of God. It ain't because Mark Burns is smart. It ain't because I made all the right decisions. It ain't because I'm better than people. No, it's because of his grace. And I'm reminded, I have to remind myself, Brother Jesse, if I don't, you can crack up really fast. <laughs> you can lose it really fast. You think that the guy that walks in the store starts shooting people and beating people or killing people or killing themselves, you think that's beyond us? No. That person, you know, struggling with a demon or mental uh, conditions, why haven't we lost our minds? Yeah. Why haven't you lost your mind out of all of the pressure that you face, Brother Jesse, that all the hell that you've had to deal with, what family and friends and business and things that didn't go right? Why haven't you cracked up? It ain't because you're so strong. And it surely ain't right. because I'm so strong, right? There's some really pit bull men, right? Alpha men, alpha women that have lost their mind. Yeah. Why haven't we? That's because amazing. of the grace and the mercy. So let me ask, time is going by so fast. Um, you're married, right, with kids and things. How did your wife handle all this, or how is she handling this? Well, I mean, it was a challenge, um, Brother JC. I mean, it was a challenge um, um, for my entire family. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I've not talked about this, um, and actually this is the first time that I'm, I'm make mentioning to you, but... Uh, you know, my family, um, we suffered uh, significantly. Um, and I know it had a lot to do with uh, this uh, uh, um, this world that I've been thrusted into. And this is what I mean, um, how Job lost everything. And Job, oh. uh, Job lost, uh, uh, you know, um, um, you know, and, and, and even his health. Yeah. Uh, Job lost his health. And I recently went through a health scare. And so I been working really hard to make sure I lose this weight and drop this weight now and make sure that I stay healthy. Maybe I could look as good as you when I when I wear a suit. <laughs> You're looking uh, better. But, you look like you haven't gone through anything. You no, know, but no, but 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 truly, I don't try to pretend to be some perfect holy than thou people. I'm a pastor because that's my assignment. That's right. not my title, right? I don't put it on and take it off. I shepherd God's people, no matter where they are in life. And so it's been a challenge uh, over the last two, three years, especially the last three years uh, of my life. But um, I can see that there's a there's light at the end of the tunnel. And at the end of the day, I got to remember, uh, Brother Jesse, that all of this really doesn't matter. Yeah. What does matter, and I can only speak for me. I can't speak for your audience. I can't speak for you. But for me, when I leave this world, and God, God bless me, I pray that he bless me with long life on this earth, healthy long life. I don't want to be, you know, sick and depressed and sad and broken in, yeah. in some home long life. I mean, healthy, long life to carry out the assignment that he made me for. But I realize at the end of the day, when I leave this world and my heart stops, if I bless to live long, that I will hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Mark, you've been faithful over a few things. You didn't get it all right, but you were faithful over a few things. For me, that's what really matters. And while I'm alive, that people may see my life, my ups, my downs, my highs, my lows, my woes, uh, you know, that that even my children, that God would restore all of my children and that they would be that, that they will walk in this assignment. Uh, uh, people will say, I can't believe pastors go through some some most uh heartened issues within their own families. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it has to do with you have so many fake pastors who just are not real, right? They but for me, in my life, most people who know me and then those who really walk in the assignment of the Lord Jesus Christ, they know that most pastors are up front taking all the arrows and all the hits and all the, that's what a real leader would do. They take all those arrows, they take all those hits, and they get wounded. 
because they are blocking, they block number one, their family from those arrows and they're blocking the church that they've been assigned to serve from those arrows. And so uh, it, it's been a challenge, um, but I know that God is a restorer and a healer, and that's where my focus has to be. Amazing. Um, oh, one, one other thing I want to ask. I know you just uh, said that you're going to be with the president, the Great White Hope. Let me see what the, pre the Great White Hope has to say today. They say, is Donald Trump an intellectual? Trust me, I'm like a smart person. <laughs> the great white hope. Um, he, he's the great white hope. He is. <laughs> that's right. And so do you have any concern at all being with him again? You're going to be with him during this campaign. You're going to still, you're still, it's not like you're still close to him. Are you, do you have any concern about what people are going to say or think or how they're going to treat you about that? What, no, I don't. Um, I think um, by now people know that I'm, my loyalty is first to Jesus Christ. So it'll be very clear to me. You know, when people say, oh, I'm worshiping the golden calf, the, you know, you call it the great white hope. <laughs> Some people call him the golden calf, right? Um, I don't. There's but one Messiah. Yeah. His name is Jesus. Uh, and I serve a one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's through him, his son, Jesus, was born. And is, he's the only way to the Father is to accept Jesus as Lord. The, the, having said that, um, I think that people would lose a lot of respect for me by now if uh, I would jump ship um, or or not support him because yeah. my stance has been the same. This is not a political calculation, Brother Jesse. This is a divine appointment to serve uh, one of God's leaders that he's chosen in this season. Um, and, and so I'm not concerned at all anymore um, of what happened um, in the first uh, 20, since 2015 to my life, um, I, I'm not concerned about that. For me, I want to make sure that I'm in the will of the Lord. So when God speaks to me, um, when the president sent me this wonderful video to to thank me for uh, my my loyalty and my service uh, to the country and, and serve uh, uh, our movement, for me, it's about religious liberties. I want to bring God back to the center of American politics and American culture. You had an interview that inspired me not too long ago. I'm not sure how old it was, but you interviewed a, a preacher who professed to be a homosexual. <laughs> and and your, just your boldness inspired me. I said, I don't know if I have risen to that level up uh, to where I would, would, would be that bold. Uh, that, you know, but there was an inspiration. And so I know there's another level that I have yet to reach. And, and I aspire to do that. So... I'm not worried at all what people say. Do you know? Me. Do you know why people? Um, I know now. I didn't know before, but I know now. But do you know why people worry or even put one iota of a concern about what others say and think about them? To me, it seems so minute and so minute. Why do people care or even worry or think about what others say and think of them? Well, I think it's because they are people pleasers. It really boils down to where who they're trying to please. Um, as I said earlier, I, I, I decided a long time ago, and especially during this political world that I've been thrusted into, uh, that I, I'm willing to lose favor with man to gain favor with God. Because in the end, he is my source. It is him who I'm aiming to please. And I don't get it right all the time because we all are human. We all have feelings. Um, yes, my feelings have been hurt. Yes, uh, when people um, let you down or they don't choose you. Um, but I have to constantly remind myself uh, that a seed that leaves your hand never leaves your life. Dr. Mike Murdoch, mentor of mine, said that. And a seed that leaves my hand never leaves my life, but it goes into my future and it creates the harvest that I'm praying for. And so when I do something kind, the biggest thing, that, and, I, and I, I use that when people say, you know that President Trump is just using you. He's just using you. The Republicans, they're just using you. Uh, you're black, and they need your black face. And you, you clearly see that the majority of us are not for the Republican Party. They, they're just using you. And, and I had to go through that. I had to deal with that. 
Um, there was a time where I began to feel just that, that I've been, I'm just being you. Nobody cares about <laughs> Mark Burns. Yeah. They don't care that I lose anything. Then no, nobody is, is, you know, uh, uh, you know, pushing uh, me to be advanced, right? Where are you when I need you? And that kind of a thought. And then I had to remind myself that yes, I am being used, but not in the way that people say been used. I am being used because God gave me a gift to be used. And that my source of favor and my source of blessing doesn't come from man. Yeah. Doesn't come from Donald Trump. It doesn't come from these interviews. I may never get to be on your show ever again. This is a great accomplishment for me to even share this with you. But if I never get invited back to MSNBC or uh, invited to CNN, um, God has done enough for me because my blessings come from him and not from, from man. And so, when I remind that to myself, I remind it, my source is God, not man. When I sow a seed into somebody's life that blesses them, like Donald Trump, it may never come back from Donald Trump right. in the way that I would like it to, yeah. but it will come back. I don't, I don't know if you could respond to this or not, so if you can't, I'm fine with it. When you were going through all that in your lowest moment, your lowest hour, uh, did the president stick with you? Absolutely. Uh, matter of fact, when the, the CNN hit took place and he was one of the first people that reached out, Nice. he said to me, you know how I feel, right? Because <laughs> he said, you know how I feel every day, right? People are always trying to set you up. Yeah. They're always trying to, you know, break your character and tell your, tear your character down and bring out things from your worst past to try to sway people away from you. And no, he's never, never left me. Matter of fact, President Trump has always been one uh, to reach out even now, again, this is 20, uh, 2024 campaign, and he's personally made sure uh, that Pastor Burns is one of my one of my loyal, loyal friends. Right on. And he says this publicly, make sure he is taken care of, which is why I was honored um, to, to be back in the midst and, and back on the team and, and do whatever I can to, number one, declare that Jesus is Messiah. Number one, that God is coming back for his children, and that when our hearts stop beating, we will stand before God. I when noticed we stand that, before God. I noticed that the president, I've watched him over the years, well, since he ran, ran for president, and I noticed that he's very loyal to his friends, those who are loyal to him. He seemed to be there for them as well. I want to know why is human nature so wicked, so evil? Human nature is evil. Why is that? Well, because when you discover in Genesis, the Bible makes it very clear that when we were born, we were born into sin, Yeah, right? The moment that Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, it unlocked, uh, it was the obedience act that unlocked the presence of Satan. Yeah. And it unlocked the authority that God had given us and we gave it away, right? And so therefore... That means the, the two punishments that was given to Adam and to Eve, if you remember the story. Number one, for Adam, the punishment was that you are now have to work for every single thing that you get, which is why real men take care of their homes. Real men work hard for their family. That's their number one priority is to protect and to serve their family, yeah. uh, to never let them go hungry. Um, but the Bible says, Adam, you're going to now have to earn from the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to work the fields. Before then, it was given to you. But now you're going to have to work for it, which bothers me about uh, 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 food stamps and entitlement programs. Because there's a certain level of helping the poor that we're supposed to do, but not help the lazy. That's yeah, the difference. That's right. And so, uh, <laughs> number two, uh, the, 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 the curse that came to woman. Uh, the curse now came that woman will now have to bear child. They'll have the pain of bearing a child. Woe, man, womb, man, man with a womb. And the pain of bearing a child is going to be the curse of a woman or a man with a womb. And so, therefore, the, the, final, the final curse to both Adam and Eve was this. You are now surely going to die. For this world has been cursed. The moment you're born, you're surely to die, right? That we're no longer going to have eternal life on this world. 
And so because everything that's now born into this world is immediately corrupted. It's immediately full of sin. Amazing. You can lock yourself up in a cabinet and have no human interaction for your whole entire life. Never do anything that will be considered sinful and still be full of sin if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because everything born in this world uh, is cursed. That's why we're going to die. So the nature of man uh, is to be sinful. Not only that, the Bible says that Satan is the prince of the air. This is his dominion. This world is his dominion. He controls this world. So the corruption that happens in the church uh, back when Jesus walked the earth and the corruption that happens in the church today or in politics or in Hollywood or whatever industry that you have in business, right, uh, like, the, like, like, like Bernie yeah. Madoff's, right, in the world, no matter what industry, there's going to be corruption and there's going to be sin because we have, Brother Jesse, a natural sinful nature. Let me, uh, in short here, all the suffering you have gone through as a result of what happened, do you have any regret of going through the suffering? No, Brother Jesse, I really don't. Oh, no. um, I think now um, that I'm happy that my faith is at a level uh, that I, I, I never would have had. Again, I thought I had great faith. I really did. I thought I was strong. Me? Do you trust people? Do I trust people? You know, I trust more of listening to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, I, I, I am I'm more uh, methodical than I was before. I'm not as happy, carefree, and to <laughs> just believe that everybody's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, no. You know, God said that we should not trust angry people, that anyone that has anger is a murderer, and that they should not be trusted. And um, uh, I've learned that anyone that has anger, even though you may give them the benefit of the doubt, but you know not to trust them if they have anger. So that if they do do something crazy, you're not disappointed about it. Where is the kingdom of heaven? Well, the kingdom of heaven, I believe, is here on earth. The Bible says that let thy will be done as it is in heaven, as it is on earth. Uh, I believe that without a shadow of a doubt, it is God's intention that we, his children, operate in our full authority. Uh, the Jesus said this, that you will do greater things than yeah. I did. When, uh, when, when you say on earth, the Father, we, you do greater things. When you said that it's me. on earth, where, do you, where on earth is the kingdom located? Are you saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of hell? It's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. I believe the kingdom of heaven operates in everyone that operates in the will of the Father, meaning that, again, you will never find this peace utopia place on earth because, as you already just mentioned, this world, we have a, 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 a sinful nature. Man's sinful nature is very much real. I but I believe that God, through the Holy Spirit, has empowered us, as Acts chapter 2 declares, that God has empowered us to tread over serpents and demons and yeah. principles, that our warfare is not of a natural one, but is of a spiritual one. Ephesians 6 makes it very clear that our weapons are not of, 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 of a flesh and blood, um, but of e wickedness in high places, principalities. These are levels of demonic spiritual entities. I noticed, that, because I noticed that the kingdom of heaven is within us. And because God said before you, Christ said, before you enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must go and forgive because anyone who has anger they are of the nature of the devil. Satan is their daddy, so you must repent for having that anger playing God. So you must go and forgive, right? Uh, yes. But I noticed that most preachers and Christians don't know that, yes, the kingdom is above, but it's also within us, and that while we live on earth, that we once we repent, we can enter into that kingdom and live from that kingdom from within, and then that way you you could be in the world but not of the world. You're not move about at all or any concern about what's happening out there uh, with others because you're no longer of it since you now live in the kingdom of heaven from within. Why don't the Christians and the preachers know that the kingdom of heaven is within and live from that kingdom? Because you know, it's kind of kind of what President Trump said uh, when when they when they tricked him up on the two Corinthians part, and they <laughs> was talking about 
Uh, they and, and it, that was a that was an internal thing, right? Uh, that was designed to try to make him look foolish, and it wasn't. It, right. it, it backfired. But the point is, uh, uh, it wasn't they, they even a big him. thing. Two B seconds, so it was the second. You know, it wasn't right. a bit, and they tried to make him look bad by making that into a, trying to make it into a big deal. Right, and and it wasn't. But the point is, they asked him, you know, uh, you know, do you do you ask forgiveness to God? And 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 what he said was, um, what people heard was, he never asked forgiveness to God. Um, that's not what he was saying. Right. What he was saying was, and this is how most of us Christians really should operate. What he was saying was, I try to do good to people first. It's easy for Christians who do horrible things to people, right? And then just say, I ask God for forgiveness and, and still the person has been done wrong. What President Trump was saying was, I, I try to do right by people first. Yeah. Uh, and the question is regarding hurting somebody, right, or doing something wrong to somebody. And that's what the context of the question. And he said, well, I don't ask for forgiveness because I try to do right to them first. I try to, I try to do right. And if I do wrong, I try to fix it by making it right. Um, but response, there are too many Christians who will hurt you, stab you in the back, yeah. uh, and, and, and smile on your face all the while trying to take your place, right? Them <laughs> the backstabber. Back you know, <laughs> that, that answer that the president gave was profound. Uh, when he said it, it blew me away because I clearly understood what he meant by that, what he was saying. It was clear. I got to ask, do you believe in the order of God in Christ, Christ over man, man over woman and woman over children? Absolutely. 100%. And so, and so God can, has a clear order. Yeah. Right? God is the head. Yeah. And through his son, Yeshua, that we have a commune relationship with the father. We can't go directly to the father unless we go through the son, the order uh, that God had created. But then God gave man. Man is the leader of his family. His wife, the Bible says, is to be submissive to uh, her husband yeah. and the children. And so, yes, I 100% believe in the order that God laid out. Are in you his the word. head of your wife? Yes, absolutely. And, and does she obey you? Yes, you're supposed to obey you. <laughs> 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 the submission. A godly woman of God, a godly wife, uh, uh, is a proper <clears throat> a third or first wife, she aims to follow that, that submission, submissiveness. Uh, to a godly husband. So when the, um, when and, you wake up in the morning, sometime you all smiling because you you're at peace, right? And she yes. wake up and she ticked off about nothing, and she's like, "What are you smiling for?" You know, blah blah blah, right? How do you deal with the hell in her when it comes out? Because a lot of men don't know how to deal with the hell in their wives. How do you handle that? Well, it really first starts with their personal relationship with God. They have to, this is why I encourage men before they get married to have a real relationship with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. No woman is going to change you, right? <laughs> and you're not going to change a woman. You cannot be 50% whole and then connecting with another woman, a woman who is also 50% whole, thinking that you two are going to come together to make 100% whole. That's not what's going to happen. Yeah. Really, you're going to have two dysfunctional 50% individuals, right, who are who are having issues within their own selves yeah. that needs to be solved before they ever become one in Christ. And so men have to first know their assignment, know their role first in Jesus by themselves before they ever get married, before they ever connect and commune with That's the woman. Deep. And once they have a real relationship with the master, once they know that they are the, the, the pastor of their home, that they are the chieftain of their home, that they are the spirit spiritual leader who is to cast out vision and they and they offer protection and to offer uh, uh, resources uh, uh, for that home that their job is to first be the sh under shepherd or the pastor to their family first their wife and that they are to walk as any pastor would within their home, leading their wife in prayer, leading their children in prayer, mm -hmm. leading Bible studies. I'm sorry in the to home. cut you, you off. You don't have to have a title to do that. Sorry to cut you off, but the clock is running down. I'm getting the signal that we're running out of I'm time. I'm sorry. Let me ask um, since it's in the man's nature to lead the woman, he's head of the woman, why do pastors allow women to become pastors? when it's not in the woman's nature to lead. 
but it's in the nature of the man. Women were created to follow and not lead. Why are so many pastors and other people, too, accepting this so-called pastor from women thing, which would put the woman over the man? Why are, is that being accepted today? Well, I think what happened is, is we got to be reminded is that Old Testament was Old Testament, which means a old covenant in which that's what uh, um, um, the old covenant existed. But then Jesus came onto the scene and created a new covenant. Yeah. Right. And so Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the old covenant or the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. Right. Uh, to make it true to its true nature. Remember, in the Old Testament, uh, 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 Moses uh, uh, was allowed to, uh, um, God allowed uh, 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 Moses to offer certificate of divorces, right? But then Jesus comes on the scene uh, and, and said, well, the only way that you should be able to divorce is specifically if adultery has been committed. And so Jesus brought more clarity to what the covenant's true nature is. Now, having said that, the very first evangelist that ever walked the earth, the very first evangelist that ever the Bible ever records, right? An evangelist, as you and I both know, is someone that goes and tell somebody that Jesus has risen. The very first people to ever record it were women when the stone was pulled back. And, 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 and the, the men did not recognize, you know the story, that right. that was Jesus sitting in the audience. They didn't know that that was Jesus. It took Mary and Martha when they saw Jesus and Jesus said, go and tell them that the Son of Man, I feel the Holy Ghost, I get chill bumps thinking about this, that has risen. The Bible said these women took off running and they ran to tell the apostles that Jesus has risen. I think when the Holy Spirit poured itself in Acts 2 um, onto his sons and daughters, the Bible says, uh, the sons and daughters, um, that, 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 that is what empowered. I'm talking about true women of God, true men of God, right? Well, I've always um, said do, that there, there are three ways of communication, telephone, telegraph, and tell a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe very clearly that <laughs> I believe that, 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 that there's not by accident um, that God knew days like this were going to come. Oh, yeah. And that he chose women. Um, to go and be the first evangelist to declare, thus saith the Lord. The, the message of Jesus is this. Jesus has risen. He is alive. He is well. And he's coming back again looking for his church. And so I, I don't think, I know that we can debate theology, um, but I simply just read what the word of God. I know what the Old Testament says, but I also know that these two women were used to spread the gospel of I Jesus. I got to ask you this, and then I got to put you on the hot seat after this. Um, okay. Number one, I noticed that men try to get love from women. And why do men try to get love from women when women don't have love to give? Because the love comes from God through Christ, through the man, through the woman, through the children. Why do men try to get something that the woman does not have, and that is love? Women don't have love. Why are men trying to get love from them rather than passing the love down to them? Well, again, it goes back to men knowing their assignment. Right? Oh, I see. It starts with the man. It doesn't start with the woman. Right. Right. It starts with the man. Yeah. And the challenge is not with the woman. The challenge is with the man failing to operate in their assignment to be the leader of their house. Even in the in the in the in the modern day church that we call church today in the society, uh, uh, it is very true that the majority of things that are getting done in church are led by women. Right. Um, and, and because men have failed to walk in their leadership assignment. But the, churches are, not but the churches are getting women. the churches are getting weaker as a result of the women Absolutely. taking over. They're not getting better because of that leadership role is coming should be coming through the man. I got any church up. growth book, brother Jason, will tell you that if you can win a father, if you can win a, a wife to a church, any church growth book will tell you, you win a wife, she'll bring a, she, she, she will come in the church. <laughs> but when you win a father, when you win a husband, you get the whole entire family, yeah. right? When a father comes, when the father prays, when the father's on his knees, when the family sees the father cry out to God, that's when whole families get saved. 
So the issue is what weak men who are who are not walking in their assignment. It's not women. It's not women. It's weak men who are not operating in their assignment to be the leader that God has called them to be. That's for sure. I got to heat this up. I got to put you on the hot seat. And I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. All right. Okay. The hot seat. Are you a nationalist? I'm a Christian nationalist. Do you no, I'm not a white supremacist nationalist. <laughs> Do you believe in climate change? No, I, I, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, I believe that there's clearly um, some medical uh, 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 scientific proof, but I don't think it's the number one threat in, 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 in the world as Joe Biden. There are way more greater threats in America. Has anyone ever told you Hoppo beat me? <laughs> 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 I had to fight. I had to fight my whole life. I say this all the time, brother. brother you listen, you ain't black unless you've seen the color purple, right? So you need to watch the color purple. I had to fight all my life. I had to fight my brother. I had to fight my husband. No. <laughs> a girl ain't safe in a man household no more. Um, do you have a plan to run for president? No, not no, no. I don't have that uh, aspiration at, at this moment. But you never know what the Lord has in store. Yeah. Right now, I'm only just serving in the capacity that I'm given. And right now, it's to make sure that Donald Trump is the 47th president of the United States. Is it okay for a black man to love the Confederate flag? Well, you know that is a challenging thing um, for me. Um, but if you know anything about history, you would know that um, you know the number one, uh, one of the largest slave owners in South Carolina was a black man. Right, who donated hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to uh, the Confederate movement uh, yeah. in Richmond, Virginia, in 1864. Uh, when uh, Richmond, which was really too late, the early part of 1864, a late uh, part of 64, and the beginning of 65, they finally allowed for Black people to sign up for the Confederate Army. And so you got to know your history, yeah. right? I'm, I'm not going to placate to one side. I'm only going to say this is history, right? And over 99 percent of uh, able bodied men signed up for the Confederate Army, right? And so uh, you know, one of the last recorded funerals um, um, uh, in, in American history, Civil War, one of the last people to die, um, and you actually have pictures of this, of a, of a Confederate dying, was of a black man in his Confederate uniform draped with the Confederate flag. Now, let me say this as a caveat to that, because just like the Nazi flag, right, the con same Confederate flag was used by the KKK to hang a lot of black people, right? People like Emmett Till and those, they used that flag to intimidate black people, especially during the Reconstruction period. So the original uh, usage of the Confederate flag was a battle flag. It wasn't the Confederate flag, but the battle flag that we infamously know, the cross, that flag uh, was uh, was taken later on after the uh, uh, after the Civil War and used as the imitation factor, like the swastika. I, of today. I was surprised. I grew up in Alabama, as you know, on a plantation, and I was surprised when the blacks started to. And I know why they did it, but now when they started to dislike the Confederate flag, because when I was growing up and we would see the Confederate flag, it just meant like an, it was, it's an honor. It was an appreciation for the South. It was an appreciation for the war. It wasn't a negative. And it only changed once the so-called civil rights movement started and they started to brainwash the black people, make them believe lies over true. And that's when that thing started to change. But I got to move on here. Do we I need, can stay right there all day long, Brother Jesse. I know. <laughs> do, I'm going to have to have you back. Do we need more white babies? Do, do we need more white babies? Yes. Well, I think we need I think we need all babies. I think we need more babies in general. We don't need to be killing our babies. And I think right now, especially within our community, the number one cause of death within the black community is aborting our children. Right. And we know the story of Margaret Sanger, who was a racist. Right. She was clearly uh, designed to try to destroy the black race. So that do, same spirit is carrying on today with Planned Parenthood. And so do we need more white babies? Do we need more white babies? I think we <laughs> I think we need all babies, Brother Jesse. Is it, okay, I think we, is it OK for a woman to have an abortion if she has been raped? I don't think so. I don't. I, I don't think so. I've been very. I know that's not a political uh, uh, 
proper thing to say, but if you go look at the story of Lot in the Bible, Lot was raped by his own daughters, right? Um, and those babies carried out the excitement of the Lord. And so it, it's difficult for me no. to kill any child for any reason. Does a chicken have lips? Does it what? A chicken have lips. Does <laughs> a chicken have lips? I, <laughs> I don't know how to. I'm not. I'm not as astute in the in animals, but I love to eat chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that July? Uh, that in July we celebrate White History Month, and this is our six or seven year coming up. And I, okay. And I started White History Month so that we will not forget the white man who founded and created the greatest country with the help of God on this side of heaven, and they're trying to erase that history. And, and and put up stupid statues like uh, what's that man name, George Floyd and an Afro comb and making Martin Luther King statue look like I don't know what. Yeah. And so we celebrate white history, and you know why we do it in July? Because July just feels white. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this, brother Jesse, I think that we don't need to be tearing down any statues in America. I think yeah. we need to be building new ones. Um, and I think that we need to be continuously celebrating, um, you know, all races in this nation and celebrating all. Nobody should be blocked for the simply the color of their skin. I think uh, that that there's so much history and it wasn't built just by one group, white or black. It, it was have, built by so many of us. Have you ever been high on the hog? High on a hog. Ever been high? No. <laughs> what have you ever, is it ever okay to tell a woman she's fat? <laughs> well, I think I think that's a private conversation between a, a husband and wife, because there's a lot of men that love some big women, right? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of women that enjoy uh, some meat on their woman. So uh, that really is in the eye of the beholder. Did you have fun? I love this interview. This is an honor. An Thank honor. you so much for coming on. Tell the folks how to get to your website or whatever information you want to put out there. Sure, Brother Jesse. They can follow me on, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at, at Pastor Mark Burns. You can also uh, go to my television network, The Now Television Network, with free thinking Americans. And so if you want to come on, bring a television show on, we would love to have you on, uh, on cable and satellite television. And also go to markburns.org. I would love to connect with you. Right on. Amazing. Thank you so much, man. That was an amazing conversation. I absolutely appreciate it. And thank you all for uh, tuning in. Don't forget that the Fall Estate is now on Locals.com. And click the link in the video description to support our work. Let me hear from you. I absolutely appreciate your support. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Pastor Byrne. God bless you, sir. You too, buddy. Amazing. Amazing.